I'm back in Westminster, and I'm here at the start of the parliamentary day, and the MPs are all turning up to do their jobs representing us, the British people. And they're all wearing the typical uniform of the British Member of Parliament, the rather uninspiring two-piece suit. Now, if one was to rewind this scene to the closing years of the 19th century, politics then was a far more formal affair. MPs wore top hats and frock coats. Which is what made the sight in 1893 all the more exciting. Walking here into the central lobby of the House of Commons, a man wearing a checked suit and a deerstalker hat, the Sunday best of a Scottish miner. His name was Keir Hardy. And in these clothes that so shocked polite society, he was making a political statement that now working class men weren't just voting in elections, they were actually standing as MPs and winning seats and another barrier on the path to our democracy was shattered. The second half of the 19th century had seen past one democratic milestone after another. Reform acts that gave votes to workers, first in the towns, then the countryside. The introduction of secret ballots, making elections fairer. But in all that time, one thing had stayed the same, the makeup of Parliament itself. Two parties, Tory and Liberal, looked much the same and felt much the same. MPs worked unpaid, so you had to be rich to stand. How well could these men in frock coats represent the interests of working people? Just to make the point clear, in 1884, get this, the British cabinet consisted of six earls, a marquis, a baron, two baronets, and just four MPs. I mean, talk about lords a-leaping. It's as if nothing had changed since the days of the glorious revolution. And that's why I want to unpack now the story of Keir Hardy, the man in the deerstalker hat, because he did something crucial for our democracy. He gave the British voter a choice. Keir Hardy was born in Legbrannock, south of Glasgow. By the age of 11, he was the family's sole breadwinner, working down the mines in the Lanarkshire coal fields. He never went to school, but he taught himself to read and write, scratching with a pin on a stone. And by his early 20s, by sheer force of personality, he was recognised as the leader of the Lanarkshire miners. The last deep-cast coal mines in Scotland closed down just a few years ago. This is now a dead industry. All that's left are fenced-off wastelands, with the pit heads looming like rusting dinosaurs. I love these places. I love the sense of working lives remembered in just the vaguest of clues. This rough ground here would have once been the pit head. The winding gear would have lowered the men down hundreds of feet below the ground in steel cages. And then up came the coal, which was carried away on these railway lines here. It's important not to get sentimental. These places, they gave employment to so many, but this was hard, dangerous work. And Keir Hardy, back in the 1870s, was one of those that threw themselves into politics to improve workers' conditions. He drew the Scottish miners into a union so they could use strength in numbers when bargaining with the pit bosses. In 1880, he led them in a victorious strike. They downed tools till the pit bosses met their demands. But Keir Hardy himself was blacklisted. The strike cost him his job. Now, up to this point, Keir Hardy had supported Gladstone's Liberal Party. And credit where it's due, Parliament in those years did much to improve the lives of working people. Liberals, Tories, they'd passed laws improving workers' conditions, housing, education. I just think that Keir Hardy got fed up watching rich aristocrats, however well-meaning, passing laws on behalf of working people whose lives they couldn't possibly comprehend. What did they know of life here, literally, at the coalface? It seemed to Keir Hardy the only solution was to get working-class men into Parliament. But how to achieve that dream? No working-class man could afford to fight an election, 
No working class man could afford to sit in Westminster unpaid. And so Keir Hardy turned to the unions. All across Britain, workers paid a small part of their salaries to the unions as a kind of insurance. The unions then helped them if times got hard. Using union dues to sponsor MPs was a new and radical idea opposed by many until events here at Lister's Mill in Bradford proved Keir Hardy's case. Our stories reach the late 1880s, a time of bitter controversy between workers and bosses all across the nation. In 1889, London was hit by a massive wave of strikes. The dock workers came out on strike, the gas workers came out on strike. London was brought almost to a standstill. Not a good time, you would have thought, for the bosses up here to cut wages by a third. And so at Lister's, the workers came out on strike joined by tens of thousands of other workers from all across Bradford. But here, the strike was brutal. The Riot Act was read, banning public demonstrations. Troops moved in, people were killed. This was like Peterloo all over again. The strike was eventually broken. After 13 violent weeks, the unions ran out of funds. It was either return to work or face starvation. So they went back to work. They stomached the crippling wage cut. And it was this, I think, that caused the unions here in England to accept the obvious fact. They needed working men in Parliament to represent their interests. And so in January of 1893, the Bradford Trades Council organized a conference here in Bradford. They invited delegates of all kinds of labor groups, union groups, socialist groups. And out of that meeting, the Labor Party, as we know it today, was formed and elected as the very first labor leader, Keir Hardy. To this day, we still have three main political parties in this country. The Liberal Party declined as the Labour Party rose. The Tories, the Conservatives, have stayed roughly constant. It's hard now to see in these modern parties the divisions of a hundred years ago. The Tories in the top hats, flat-capped Labour. Class was more apparent then. What remains, though, is choice. The choice to approve, the choice to oppose. That's what democracy is all about. And that, in part, was Keir Hardy's legacy.